So I'm, I'm actually, this is the first day of the semester where I'm actually kind of nervous because uh, it's that important. And not to put pressure on you, pressure is on me. Because if I do my job of explaining these concepts and getting good analogies for these concepts, y'all are going to be like, that's super easy. Um, but it is outside of the box. But know that everything I'm going to tell you has a logic to it, and it follows Newton's law. some things. Make sure we're on the same page about what things mean. Okay? Remember how I said at the beginning of the semester this is almost kind of like a second language class where it's just getting on the same page about verbiage. So muscles can only pull, correct? And this class is specifically about skeletal muscles. Now how many of you guys uh, watched, uh, well, I'm sure you guys were out um, you know, trick-or-treating or something. Uh, philanthropy uh, work. But uh, after we got back with the boys, I needed to wind down. So I put on the football game and I was watching the football game last night and flipping back to the Pelicans. I want you to think of skeletal muscles. Okay? Skeletal muscles, not, not cardiac muscle of the heart or smooth muscle of you know the, that, that line arteries and things, but skeletal muscles. Skeletal muscles are all part of the team. In other words, you think of an individual sport like tennis, right? Where not couples tennis, but just individual tennis. It's that's you. <laughs> like it's you. Or 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 maybe an individual uh, event in gymnastics. I know gymnastics, there's a team, but they do individual awards for everything. That's just you. No skeletal muscle is just you. They're all part of the team. Every muscle. Not the heart, the diaphragm, but, but skeletal muscles are all part of a team. And sometimes, remember how I said that, you know, bad verbiage or, you know, you, you play the pro science and these things get etched in our minds and it's hard to etch them out. When you look at an exercise such as this, and I say to my 73-year-old dad, hey dad, what am I working during that exercise? I guarantee you he's going to say, make sure you work in your mindset. Oh, yeah, your dad knows a lot. And, and, and that's not incorrect. But the thing is, though, is that if all we ever do is name one muscle, we forget that there's other people on that team. You know, like in other words, if the Saints win the Super Bowl, did Drew Brees win a Super Bowl? Technically, but other people were part of that team. He didn't do it by himself. So what happens is, is that we only talk about like superstar muscles, and usually these superstar muscles. No offense to the bicep, but they're superficial. You know? and, and, and superficial, I know in our terms, kind of means bad thing. Oh, that person's superficial then. You know? But superficial for us just means they're visible. They're seen. You know, the biceps, kind of the one you see. You don't see the ones underneath, and you don't see the ones kind of working behind the scenes doing the dirty work. You usually only talk about the superstar. And it's common in our field to play fast and loose with superstars. Hey, what muscles am I working here? Oh, you're working your glutes and your hands and your quads and your core. And you just kind of generically say the same superstars and you lose track of that, man, they, those, those muscles aren't working at all, okay? In addition, playing fast and loose is not good enough for some of the things you guys need to be doing. It's okay to play fast and loose when you're talking to a novice, you're talking to um, uh, someone at the clinic that you're working with, they don't need to know all these special muscles names, right? So it's okay to be like, we're working on your quads or you let, you know, your big glutes in your hands. But, but you're going to have to actually know who's on those teams. You have to know all the players that are in those teams. So like last night, the Pelicans won their first game, right? The Pelicans are a team and we call them the Pelicans because we know that it's everybody <laughs> together that that's the team. And then there's individual players on the team, you know, Ingram and Zion, who's out for a while, and Drew Holiday. And certain players are more important, maybe, than other players. But the point is, is that I don't have to say, hey, 
uh, did your team win this weekend? Or who is your team? I don't have to list every player on the team. I just say the Saints. And it infers all the players. So what we are going to do conceptually is do away for now with bicep, hamstrings, quads, glutes, tries. Because all that does is it focuses on the superstar. And you lose track that, hey, there's other muscles that are part of that team that are helping me lift what I'm trying to lift. So the concept is, is we are going to talk about muscles based off of the team. In biomechanics, we're going to name all the players in the team. We're going to talk about, you know, hey, this is a this is an all-star right here, and this is, you know, this is a bitch player here. But in this class, we have to look at it fundamentally for what it is, that every skeletal muscle you have does not work by itself. Everyone has help. They're all part of a team. Now, what's really super cool is that in regular team sports, you can't change teams. Or I guess you could get traded. And so I guess technically you could look at it like that. But certain muscles can be on certain teams based on how they crawl. So like, you can have a certain muscle that might pull at the hip at an angle, and some of its pull is here, and some of its pull is there. So it could be part of two different teams. Okay. So instead of naming all of these teams just like random crazy names, the names of all of these teams are actually very easy to remember. They're named based on the direction of their pull. How do they pull? Let me give you an example of something that gets its name based on how does it pull. An elevator gets its name based on how does it pull. Remember, your instinct is to say an elevator is an elevator because it brings you up. And I'm trying to get you to say, although that's not untrue, that's only a third of its function. Another third of its function is to prevent you from falling down. In other words, keep you at the same place while you get along, while you get off, but it's still pulling up. Another function is to let you go down at a very comfortable rate so that you don't lose your cookies. But guess what? It's still pulling up. So making you go up while pulling up, keeping you from falling down, while pulling up, letting you go down while pulling up. So why does an elevator get called an elevator? Because it pulls up. Not that it makes you go up. It can make you go up with concentric work. That's just an analogy for the elevator, obviously. It doesn't have a little silly in there. And it can keep you from falling down through isometric analogy. But, or it can let you go down through eccentrics. But the concept is that in all three scenarios, it was trying to pull you. Why is a hip flexor? I mean, we're going to get into some specifics in biomechanics, but I think that's a common term you've heard in sport, pull the hip flexor. Why is a hip flexor called a hip flexor? Your instinct is to say because it flexes the hip. And I'd be like, a third of the time, <laughs> but, but that same muscle could prevent your leg from falling down. And another third of the time, it can let you go down or slow down extension so that it can change direction and you can speed up the flexion. My point is, is that actually responsible for flexion a third of the time. But in all three cases, of concentric, eccentric, or isometric, guess what it is doing the entire time? Pulling in the direction of flexion. It's based off of its pull, not its result. That is extremely important. A muscle, in terms of its group, its team, is based off of its pull, not its result. The bicep is not called a flexor because it is involved in flexion. My tricep can be involved in flexion. See what I'm trying to say? 
that it's not about muscle associated with motion. Someone could passively flex me and extend me. That doesn't mean my muscles are responsible for it. it has, it's not about the motion you observe. It's about the direction of pull of the muscle. It's one of your commandments. We do not associate muscles with motion because that will get you wrong a lot. What we can do is associate muscles with their direction of pull. How they pull, not necessarily what they are responsible for. I'll give you another example. Uh, my friend, Coach Jeff Davis, was a high school coach of mine, good friend of mine, passed away a few years ago, and he's from Chicago. And it took me 45 minutes, and this isn't talking about Coach Jeff as, Coach is a smart guy. And he was like, we were talking about the push-up. And he said, uh, Brian, I don't understand. Why isn't the push-up the ultimate exercise? He's like, you work your chest on the way up and you work your back muscles on the way down. I was like, coach, I love you, that's ridiculous. And he was like, but you're, you're doing the motion of a row on your way down, if you think about it, right? You lower yourself down on the push-up, aren't you doing the same motion as a row? The answer is yes, you're doing the same motion. That doesn't mean the same muscles are responsible for that motion. So he was doing one of the cardinal sins of muscle function, and that's associating a certain motion with a certain muscle. What's this exercise called when you get into the little machine and you do this? And the little padding is... Leg extensions, that's the worst name that you could possibly give it in terms of misleading you to muscle and function. Because half of the time I'm flexing my, my knees. First of all, a leg doesn't do any motion, joints do motion. Second of all, muscles don't flex, joints flex. So you can just see how playing fast and loose kind of gets some of this bad verbiage etched in our mind. So this is how these problems arise. I'm on the leg extension machine and I'm working my quads. Leg extension, quads, extension, quads, extension, quads. So every time you see extension, you're going to think you're working quads. And so when I flip over and I start doing curls, my coach sees extension as I'm going down. He's like, must be the quads. Because there's extension there. That's not how muscles work. It's all about the direction of pull, not the motion, okay? So how are we gonna compartmentalize these in groups? Dude, super easy, super easy. I'll tell you what would be hard. What would be hard is just randomly coming up with team names, right? Where, where uh, you'd have to learn like the Golden State Warriors and, and the, the, the Memphis Grizzlies, that's just random. The muscles that are in teams or groups are named based on their direction of pull. So what I mean by that is, uh, this is when you know I'm serious. So what I'm saying is, is that we are going to need logically as many teams, group names, as we have allowable joint motions. If you think about it. In other words, if I'm setting myself up as a puppet, I need to make sure I have strings that pull in every direction of motion that I allow for. That means if my subtalar joint inverts and everts, I need muscles that pull in those directions of motion. If my ankle dorsi flexes and plantar flexes, I need strings and muscles that pull in those directions of motion. If my knee flexes extend, same thing. I need muscles and strings that pull in those directions. Even externally and internally rotating. I need ropes strings, muscles that pull in every direction of motion. Let's not forget, skeletal muscles are there to move us, and they're there for stability as well. But this is a movement class, so we're not, we're not disrespecting the stability component, we're respecting the rotary mobility component, because that's what this class is mostly about. We'll get into the stability stuff in final camp. So here's how it works. Knowing that no skeletal muscle works alone, every one of them is in a group. It could be a small group, 
be a group of two. There could be a big group. Some groups have seven or more. But everybody is on a team. And the team name is based on the direction of pull of those players, the direction of motion. So for the example of this exercise, right, the curl, layman's terms. I don't have a problem with layman's terms, but we have to know what's really happening here. The external force in this case, the dumbbell, planet Earth pulling down, is trying to cause what to his elbow? What's it trying to do to his elbow? Extend it, right? It's trying to cause extension. So he's going to have muscles that pull in the elbow joint in two directions of motion. He's going to have muscles that pull in the direction of flexion, and he's going to have muscles that pull in the direction of extension. Now, every muscle in the body is like, um, is like a, a, a service worker. In other words, if you're at your apartment house growing up and the plumbing needed help, you made a phone call to a specific person to come to a job. Hole in your wall, you made a call to a specific person to come to a job. Electric, you know, electric stuff, you call electrics to do a job. That's how muscles are. I'm doing an exercise. I need to make a phone call to a specific group of muscles to do a job. And because the weight is trying to extend me anyway, do you think I want to call muscles that pull in the same direction of that motion? No. If I called the muscles that actually pulled in the direction of extension, I'd have two different forces working in extension. Oh, my heart myself. If the weight is trying to extend me, I need to call the muscles that are pulling in the direction of flexion, the opposite direction of pull, or influence in this case. I need to call a group of muscles called the elbow flexors. Now, for my athletic training students, if in your textbook it says Flexion, that's fine. Add another word to it. Flexion pullers. <laughs> that's how I need you to look at it. It's pulling in the direction of flexion. Flexion pullers. Because as we know, it's not always going to be responsible for flexion. In fact, if you imagine, if he lowers it down, it's still the same muscles. But there's extension there. So, so these muscles aren't always going to, that's like if you go play a game, you're not always going to win. You're trying to win, but, but you're not always going to do what you're trying to do. So if we say the biceps break guy is involved in flexion, its function is flexion, it wrongfully etches into your mind that every time I see flexion, it's going to be because of that muscle. And I need you to understand that. I need you to understand that we can't say this muscle does this motion because 66% of the time, that's not the case. How do you explain it when there's no motion? In other words, if he just holds this position and there's no motion, how do you explain it? The only way you can explain it is that it's still pulling in the direction of flexion. Even though I don't observe any motion, it's not about the motion. It's about the pull. It's about the pull. It's about the climb, said by the famous poet Miley Cyrus. Okay? So we can't get into muscles in motion. We have to look at them in terms of direction of pull. So, our groups are pullers of motion. At the elbow, we have elbow flexors and we have elbow extensors. Now, the pores, flexors, does not mean flexion. They can do flexion, but they can also prevent motion. They can allow extension. They can slow down extension. Elbow extensors pull in the direction of elbow extension. Hip flexors pull in the direction of hip flexion. And they can cause flexion, absolutely. 
but they can also prevent extension or they can allow extension while pulling in the direction of flexion. The function of muscle has to be what do all those options of contractions have in common? Directional pull. Because you know what they don't have in common? Motion. In fact, all three have nothing in common in terms of motion. But they all have one thing in common, direction of pull. And that's how they get their group names. So every joint motion that you're responsible for has a group of muscles that pull in those directions. You have external rotators that pull in the direction of external rotation. You have internal rotators that pull in that direction. You have left transverse cervical rotators and right transverse cervical rotators and left transverse trunk rotators and right transverse trunk rotators. And you know what's the, the beauty of this is that you don't have to stress about knowing what they are right now. We'll get into that in the biomechanics. You don't have to know hundreds of muscles in the body. All you have to know is a concept that if my neck does this, I gotta have something that pulls that way. And if my shoulder does this, I gotta have something that pulls that way. And if my arm does this, I have to have something that pulls that way. There are as many muscle groups, teams, there's as many teams of muscles. There are as many muscle groups as there are joint motions. That should make sense, right? Because we have to have something that pulls in every direction of motion. So, agonist groups, or eventually we're just going to talk about it in terms of the agonist. We're going to infer groups because this class is all about groups. <laughs> it's all about teams. In biomechanics, we'll say the agonistic muscle. We could talk about specific individual muscles. But here it's all about the team. So the agonist, what that term means is here in, in this class. Agonist means who did you call to do a job above rest? Who got a phone call to do work, to contract? And by work, I'm not talking about mechanical work because this person, if he holds this position for 10 minutes, He's going to fatigue. There's no mechanical movement, but you know what? There is movement, physiological movement. There's a lot of movement happening within the muscle itself. So this is physiological work. Who are you going to call to do a job? He needs his elbow flexors to work more than rest to do a job. <laughs> because if they didn't turn on to do the job, this is what would happen. An unwanted motion. Your cervical extensors, for most of you that are sitting up like this, got a pin? I just want to make sure, just want to make sure. Um, your cervical extensors right now are doing a job to keep your head up because if they turned off or you stopped calling them, and that happens at 7.30 in the morning, they're doing a job. Your agonists are, who's doing a job? Who am I gonna call? If this was the Halloween lecture, I'd let off with some Ghostbusters to use. Who are you going to call? Now, if the agonist is who are you going to call, the antagonist is, hey, who do I not want to call right now to do a job? Now, keep in mind, there is some, there is some confusion here because a lot of times you're going to have co-contractions of groups. Know that co-contraction stuff has nothing to do with movement. It has everything to do with stability. You gotta, you gotta make sure those bones stay articulate. What I'm talking about is who can and who can't do the job of motion. If I'm doing curls and I need muscles that pull in the direction of flexion, my extensors aren't gonna help me because they can't push me into I'm gonna say, hey, extensors, I know you can help, but I don't need you right now to do this job. I need a plumber. I need, I need a specific person to do a specific job. Take a break. I may need you at the next exercise. Okay? So, everybody is familiar with, uh, maybe somebody can help me with page. Uh, what is that A plus B is equal to C page? 
61. Great. So everybody's familiar with the concept of, um, of variables, where if you have a basic equation, like a plus b is equal to c, and any two variables you have, you can solve for the third, right? In other words, if, if you have a and b, c is super easy. If you have c and b, then it may have to work a little bit more, but you can figure out b, and if you have b and c, you can figure out a. And so one of the beautiful things about mechanics, and make no mistake, guys, we're doing mechanics. We're, we're doing engineering, just applying it to the human body, which is stuff we understand. We understand the human body. Guys, the great thing about physics and engineering is that you can't misinterpret it. It's, it's an is. <laughs> the numbers are the numbers. The concepts are the concepts. Unlike in physiology, and I'm not saying mechanics is better than physiology, it's better for me because the story doesn't keep changing. You know, we learn more about the physiology of this enzyme, that enzyme. We think this is what happens. Guys, Newton has been pretty solid for a few hundred years. And all of this is based off of Newton common sense. So here's what I'm trying to get you to see, is that through this equation that I'm going to teach you, we are going to be able to solve, to prove the contraction work. In other words, there's going to be no guessing. Well, I think it's concentric. I think it's eccentric. After I'm done with you, you're going to be like, I know it's concentric. I know it's eccentric because Newton isn't wrong. Okay? We're going to prove contraction, and I'm going to show you how. We're going to prove it. The first variable, now, we're going to have to be some detectives, some kinesiological uh, detectives, and we're going to look for clues. Whose clues? Whose clues? Whose clues? Yeah. There's clues, man. Remember I told you there's clues in motion? Well, there's clues in who do I need to call to do a job? And the first thing we're going to have to solve for, we're going to have to solve for this first term, the A. A plus B is going to elicit the contraction. Right? We have to solve for who's doing a job, who are, who's working above the rest. And the easiest way to solve for who's working above the rest is to ask a simple question. Why do I need them to work? Why do I need to call them? There's a hole in my wall. That's why I need to call the, the carpenter. Uh, my, my toilet's overflowing. That's why I need to call the plumber. Lights don't come on. That's why I need to call the electrician. So the easiest way to see who we need to call is to ask, why do we need to call them? In this picture right here, ask yourself, what motion is the external forces? External meaning in external to his skin, gravity, weight, cables, the ground, things outside of you, internal forces or your muscles. What motion are all the different external things, the weight pulling on gravity, uh, gravity pulling on the weight, the center of the planet pulling down on his arms and the weight is trying to extend his elbows. The last thing he needs is to actually use muscles that pull in the same direction. You know what that would be like? That would be like a tug of war rope where both teams go on one side and there's no team on the other side. They say, ready, go. Sometimes you need that. Rare functional cases, you need that. Like when you're sprinting as fast as you can, you need gravity and your muscles to move in the same direction. But think about how rare that is. Guys, Usain Bolt, fastest man in the planet in the world. His job is to go fast, but he probably does 0.0001% of his activities a day of living going faster than gravity. And think about it. how often is he sprinting in terms of a 24-hour day? Most of your, a majority, 99% of the time, your muscles are going to be playing tug of war against something external. That's just how we work. We work in slow and controlled motions. 
We have the ability to go faster than gravity, but that's just when a mosquito lands on you. How often does that happen as a function of your overall life? So knowing this, we can use it to our advantage. It's all about tug of war. It's all about seeing if the external force is trying to pull the rope this way, I need to make a call to muscles that are pulling the other way to influence the motion, slow and control. If the external forces are trying to pull the rope that way, I need to make a phone call to muscles that are pulling the other way. If the external force is trying to bring me this, I need to call muscles that are doing that. It's all about setting up a tug of war scenario especially in exercises in therapy. Slow and control. Now again, I'm not saying there's not exceptions to the rules. I'm going to cover those in a, in, in, a, in a future lecture. But a majority of everything you do, the muscles that you need to call to do a job are in the opposite direction of things that are trying to take your head down. Gravity's trying to flex you. Guess what? I need extensors. If gravity is trying to adduct my shoulder, guess what? I need muscles that pull up. And in this case, we call them ab abductors. If gravity is trying to extend me, guess what? I need shoulder flexors. But Dr. Campbell, why don't you just say deltoid? And I'm like, why don't you just say Zion Williamson? <laughs> There's other players there. So instead of saying anterior deltoid, biceps break on short head, coracobrachialis, clavicular fibers of the pectoralis major, if I say shoulder flexors, I cover everybody. Anything that pulls that way can help my team. How easy is that? Let me ask you this, Do, who has a, ner a nurse in the family? Nurses, that's some tough work, and they have to know a lot. But do they know everything? That's impossible. So they have reference books, right? You have a physician's desk reference to see what medicines are contraindicated. It's impossible to know all that. So what I'm saying is that this classroom of what should be 80 people on a Friday morning, I understand. Some of you are going to have to know the functions of every single muscle based on your future job, and that's cool, but not all of you will need to. So if I can get home the point that I'm using my shoulder flexors, all of the muscles, not just one, I'm using my elbow flexors, not just the bicep, but anything that pulls in that direction, I'm making a call to come help. It's like when you move it, you all hands on deck, everybody come that you know come help. Elbow flexors, done. Versus my bicep, my brachialis, my brachioradialis, my teres major. <laughs> you can just look them up. If someone's like, that's not good enough. What are, what are the, the muscles that do that? You can, if you know them, you can say them. But if you're like, oh, we can look them up. But that's irrelevant. I just know I need to call upon some muscles that pull that way to do this job. So identifying your agonist, the group that you need to recruit above resting tone to do a job is as easy as asking, why do I need to recruit them? <laughs> Let me give you another example. I say, yeah, let's uh, do some tricep let-ups. Does it mean you do that at the time? No. Okay, so can everybody understand that if you associate muscles with motion, some people might get this confused with the other because you're doing the same motions. Flexion, extension, flexion, extension, flexion, extension, flexion, extension. So if you're working with someone, maybe you have an intern. Guys, one day you are going to be the people I'm sending students to. I'm selfish, man. I want my tree to have as many branches as possible. I want y'all to be successful. So guess what? So that I can use you and say, I have a good kid that needs an internship, and I'm going to send them to you. 
Okay? I'm selfish. One day you may be working with one of these interns or our student gets some observation hours, and they're going to say, why does this work the tricep and the other one work the bicep? You're doing the same motions because maybe they don't understand that you can't associate muscles with motion. Right? And you're going to have to be able to say, well, because I need different groups of muscles to do different types of jobs. In other words, why do I need my elbow flexors here? Because the weight is trying to extend you. Why do I need elbow extensors here? Because the weight is trying to flex you. It's a big difference, <laughs> trying to flex you versus trying to extend you. And this is the crazy part. Your body knows all of this stuff, man. It does. I just need to get your mind to trust what your body knows. I'll give you an example. Connor, can you stand up for me? Put your arm out in the front. Don't let me push you down. He knew which muscles to use. Now, I'm trying to push him down. Guess which muscles he needs to use, the ones that pull up. How do you know? Don't let me push you down, because you can see it. When I let him go, pull up, pull her. Don't let me push you across. Don't you dare let me push you across. Why did he recruit those muscles? He doesn't know the names of them. No offense, I'm just using this one. But he knows that something is trying to horizontally adduct him. And thus, he needs to use horizontal adductors to play tug of war against it. Don't let me push you up. Don't let me push you up. I'm trying to flex him. So what does he recruit? Extensors. Who are those muscles? Who cares? It doesn't matter. You just need to know that I have muscles that pull down in the direction of extension, and sometimes I need them if something's trying to flex me. I don't want to have elbow like this, elbows like this. I should. Okay. Don't let me right here, right here. Don't let me pull you down. Don't let me pull you down. Who did he make a call to? His flexors or extensors? Flexors. Don't let me push you up. Don't let me push you up. Who's getting the call? There you go. Your body knows all this. Your body knows when you go into a machine who to make the call to. <laughs> All I need to try to teach you is Bleh, to be able to say it. This dude knows who to make a call to, but can he say it? Can he express it? Typically, we express it with tricep, bicep. <laughs> what I'm trying to tell you is that's not wrong, but what about the encomius muscle? get no love. There's other things there, right? So if we say he's working his elbow extensors, the muscles that pull in the direction of extension, well, who are those muscles? That's the triceps break guy and the encomius muscle. But that doesn't change the fact that he needs muscles that pull in the direction of extension to do a job because that weight is trying to flex him. So far, so bad? Okay. Now, the training wheels are on right now because all of my scenarios are isometric, preventing motion. Who do I need to make a call to to prevent motion? <clears throat> on Monday, we're going to start moving. I hate this word, but I have to use it. Hey, check this out. I think, and maybe I'm wrong, won't be the first, I think a lot of people would look at that and say, work in the quads. <laughs> because, because it's a machine that's common that you sit into and you move your legs. They just assume. But you, you little young kinesiology detectives, you, will say, Whoa, 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 let's not just assume. Let's see which group of muscles are doing a job based on why they need to do the job. That padding 
can't use Jedi mind forces. <laughs> that, right? Things have to push on other things. So that padding is pushing on the back of his leg, trying to cause what motion at the knees? Extension. The machine is trying to extend your knees. So do you think he needs to make a phone call to extensors? No. That would be two teams pulling on a rope with no team goes up. Now, could he call his extensors? Yeah, and the weight would go flying and clanging and then he would be a clanger. We don't like weight clangers. If the machine is trying to extend him, we need to call flexors. If the machine is trying to take his knee this way, we need to make a phone call to muscles that pull the other way. In this case, to prevent his knee from extending through isometric work above resting tone. Let me show you what would happen at resting tone. Pretend I have a trank dart. <laughs> his leg would fly up. In other words, if we turned off all the muscles in his leg, wouldn't the machine extend? Yeah, that's resting tone. <laughs> it has to be above rest to be considered contracting, working. Remember, contraction is a tough term. I, I don't like that term because it infers shortening. But we, we lectured on this last time that when a muscle is contracting, it doesn't have to shorten. It can be lengthened or it can have no change. But it's trying to contract. It's trying to shorten. So that's why I use the term work a lot, doing a job. It's trying to get the job done. Okay? I need knee flexors in this exercise. And what I'm going to teach you next week is that I need knee flexors in this exercise regardless of if I'm flexing or extending. And the reason is, is because that machine is trying to extend me regardless of if I'm flexing or extending. That machine is trying to extend my knees the whole time. So guess what I need to call the whole time? When you're doing curls, you're using the same muscles the whole time. Because that weight is trying to move you the whole time. How about we do one more? I'm in a rhythm. Not being able to spell. Don't think of body. Just move your body. Uh, here we go. Uh, it's probably not a good one because the soft endpoint is. needs to maintain this position for the picture, right? So he's got to keep it here, prevent motion, elevator. Stay still so that you can get on or off. But that elevator cable still doing a job, preventing you from falling down. It's the same concept. His muscle groups are doing a job preventing the plate from falling into him. So your job as detectives, theoretical kinesiologists, is to say, who do I need to call? And the best way to know who you need to call is to understand why you need to call. That plate and the backrest is trying to compress his joints like an accordion. What motions are the external forces trying to cause at his knees? Knee flexion. Do you think we need to call knee flexors to do a job? 
If you did, you'd pull your feet away from the plate. It would fall down on you. The obvious answer should be, I need knee extensors. Now, that concept is what's most important. Because when you start to, well, I need a vastus medialis, vastus lateralis, rectus femoris, vastus intermedius, then, then, then I need knee extensors. I need muscles that pull in the direction of knee extension to do a job. Then we'll get to who's on the team later. When you start throwing all these individual players, it clouds the concept of teamwork. What about the hip? Do I need hip flexors or hip extensors? Hip extensors, absolutely. Who are they? Who cares? For now. You just need to know that I need muscles that pull this way because I have something that's trying to make me go that way. You can see this with simple thought experiments. That's what's great about physics. You can do thought experiments. That's Einstein did. He didn't think all thought experiments. You could say, what would happen if I turned off all the muscles? You could see that if he turned off all his muscles, <laughs> That would happen. And that would cause flexion at the knees and flexion at the hips. What would happen if I turned off all the muscles in my shoulder? Adduction. What would happen if I turned off all the muscles at my shoulder? Extension. I mean, you could literally do thought experiments that can lead you to who you need to call. Guys, one more thing before I turn you loose for a wild and crazy weekend. You have the unique ability to be able to practice this stuff if you're awake. If you're awake, when you're holding that RC Cola this weekend, hmm, what's gravity trying to do to my elbow? Who do I need to call to do a job to prevent that from happening? I'm just saying that when you're in the weight room, Think about those things. When you're doing repetitions, when you're doing repetitions, pause the elevator. If you're doing curls, say, elevator, stop. Okay, external force trying to. Just some techniques. You have the ability to practice this stuff if you are awake. And first thing on Monday, I'm going to say, anybody have any questions about anything you practice this weekend? Right?